Okay, we are live on Facebook and we're gonna start broadcasting. So um, welcome to everyone who's joining us on Facebook. We'll be starting in a minute or two. I know we're running about a couple minutes late, but we'll, we'll be starting in a minute or two. Thank you everyone who's joining us. I know we uh, opened up the broadcast a little late, so we'll give you a minute to join. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to everyone to part four of our series demystifying U.S. history and activating sick action for black liberation movements. Um, today we'll be talking about fighting for black trans lives in liberation movements and I'm so happy to have our two guest speakers here with me today. The first is Chris Snyd, um, a soci sociology PhD candidate and Fulbright recipient at the University of Connecticut where their work focuses on Black LGBTQI activism, identity, world-making in the US and Brazil. Chris currently serves on the board of directors of the Audre Lorde Project, a lesbian, gay, bisexual, two-spirit, trans, and gender non-conforming people of color community organizing center, focusing on the New York City area. And we also have Yasmin A. Harris, an Afro and Black American feminist and woman of trans experience. She's a community organizer, thespian and poet, cook and student. Yasmin has been a member of the Audre Lorde Project for three years, a member of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project and the Trans Generational Theater Project for two years. So I am so happy to introduce our two panelists today. Um, and with that, I will let you both take it away. Welcome everyone. Um, today in our, our presentation, in this session, we're going to discuss Black trans lives and experiences within U.S. society by taking a critical look at structural and historical inequality. We aim to help all of our participants define important concepts and points of US history, learn about progressive movements and exclusion of trans and gender nonconforming, which is what TGNC stands for, become more knowledgeable about Black TGNC communities, activism, and leadership worldwide. This webinar is organized into seven sections. Our first section is overview, the second is definition. Um, th our third section is Rethinking the American Dream. Our fourth is Exclusion in Social Justice Movements. And our fifth, Imagining Liberation, Black Trans Power, Revisited. Our wrap up in our question and answer session. There will be, uh, there's also going to be two five minute breaks um, after session three and session five. Um, this, uh, during those times, will be a great time for you writing your questions um, for our Q&A in the chat. Otherwise, you can direct message um, Prop D during the presentation to um, give your question. The questions that, we, that are guiding this presentation um, is one, how has gender been used and constructed as a way to control Black life and by extension, society as well. How is transphobia linked to both intra and inter community violences in contemporary times and historically? How have these dynamics in the US been connected to any global movements or developments? Um, in this section, this is our definition. As we move forward, we want to lay down common language for all of us to work with. Um, in this section, we want to define race, racial, ra racialization, racism, anti-Blackness, sex, gender, and gender identity, sexuality, and LGBTQ. Um, 
race is socially constructed idea that ascribes meanings and categories based on cultural, physical characteristics. Racialization is the process of adding racial meaning to certain relationships, practices, or groups. And racism is the perpetuation of racial domination, power imbalances, and social privileges through institutional and structural oppression. It is related to historical, legal, econ economic, excuse me, and interpersonal patterns of violence within society. We also have some, okay. um, anti-blackness is our first definition. Another definition is both a concept and series of practices within a society. Ideologically, anti-blackness is both biased and dehumanizing thoughts about black African descendants and darker skinned people and the structural oppression of those groups through targeted discrimination, disenfranchisement, devaluation of cultural practices of people racialized in proximity to blackness. Black identity is global as well as anti-blackness as a structure and ideology, it forces us to ask, how are the darkest among us treated? And how is desire, economy, politics, and social practices organized? Next, we're gonna talk about sex, gender, and gender identity. Sex describes the physical characteristics of a body being masculine, feminine, or other variations at birth. Gender is the social meanings, classification, cultural values, and idea, ideas applied to bodies. And gender identity is our personal identification on the spectrum of gender. We also talk about cisgender, a term describing peoples whose gender identities matches their assigned gender and sex at birth. And transgender is a term that describes people whose gender identity does not match the socially assigned classifications. Sexuality is part of a complex set of feelings, desires, sexual attractions, and practices. Conversations and gender around about gender and sexuality are often misrepresentative. Someone's gender or gender identity does not automatically indicate their sexuality or sexual preferences. Our LGBTQ plus definition is the L stands for lesbian, which are women who are primarily attracted romantically and sexually to other women. The G stands for gay, men who are primarily attracted romantically and sexually to other men, bisexual, a person who experienced attraction to people of the same gender and another gender, transgender, a gender description for someone whose gender identity is different than that assigned at birth. Queer is an umbrella term for individuals who don't identify as straight. Two-spirit is an under umbrella term within Native American communities for individuals who embody qualities of, and roles of both feminine and masculine genders. And gender nonconforming is a gender identity that indicates a person that identifies outside of the gender binary. Oh, okay, my bad. Yeah, and in this presentation, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Okay. Um, in this presentation, we use transgender and gender nonconforming as umbrella terms for gender diverse individuals. I apologize. You, no worries, but before I go to the next slide, I, I put an asterisk here. So talking about the definition of gay, for instance, that often folks, you know, it does on one end signal men who are romantically and sexually attracted to men. But then we both wanted to highlight that sometimes um, use folks use an umbrella term, maybe 
um, like lesbians might use the word gay or other things. And so that was just a note that I wanted to add on really fast, but I'll give it back to you, Yasmin. Yeah, I apologize. It's just a little message popped up over it, so I couldn't see it. Um, our, third, um, our third section is talking about rethinking the American dream in the media and in common conversation. Many people describe the U.S. as a place where dreams take flight. However, in reflecting on the question, how has gender been used and constructed as a way to control Black life and by extension, society as well? It is evident, is, it is evident that the so-called American dream may be rooted in myths. In this section, we talk about influence of settled colonialism and slavery in the United States by looking at history, we will challenge the idea that every man is created equally within the US social imagination. Anti-Black, anti-trans legal and institutional doctrines review critical examples of legal and structural frameworks that work to exclude non-white racial groups and gender variant people. All right, awesome. Thank you for, for setting us off, Yasmin. Um, so this section, as I take over again, it's renamed Rethinking the American Dream in response to this question on gender and its construction and control of Black life. Um, and so this is a bit of history um, and references, so bear with me as I go along. Uh, the first thing I want to highlight is that you know, there's an ever expanding literary and scholarly attention to the roots of inner, in inequality in contemporary society. Um, and to highlight again, the legacies of slavery and settler colonialism are more and more thought of relevant to the very structure of the United States and not as just random events that have occurred in society. Um, uh, here, I'm thinking as a sociologist, but there's po political histor historic evidence that talks about this. Um, and for example, uh, folks talk about how these things, slavery and settler colonialism, are at the very core of the U.S. nation. Um, sociologist Moon Ki Jung has stated that the United States has always been an empire state. Um, it is all, the U.S. has always been a racial state, a state of white supremacy, and this is um, from Jung's 2001 book on page one. Um, and in a way, since we're always talking about the American dream, how could we arrive at such a statement, right? Like, how could this sociologist get there? And part of the reason is, um, again, settler colonialism which is this process of removing, erasing, and violently taking the land and life of indigenous people is inherently tied to the founding of the United States, along with much of the Western hemisphere. And so though that's like just an inescapable, inescapable fact that we have to deal with. Um, and behind it, I, I have a cover of a different book that's called The Indigenous People's History of the United States that talks about these things, right? Um, and so this is happening at the very founding of our nation. And, you know, this step removal and genocide, right? Like that is at the heart of, of a social structure. Um, and so again, talking about the land theft through, let's say, unrecognized treaties and political deception, per, uh, perpetual wars on sovereign indigenous nations and communities that were already living um, in this land, you know, that we call the United States, um, the subsequent occupation of their territories has been and is widely documented by both critical scholars um, and U.S. historical documents, right? Like our history says that these things have taken place. Um, and the human casualties of this project have been enormous. According to Stannard's 1993 book, well over 100 million Native Americans were killed during the first five centuries of like making the US, and I'm saying like after we always talk about 1492 um, and Christopher Columbus, like so after this moment, so many people have, have lives have been um, taken and affected by this process. And unfortunately, like I have to know is settler colonialism isn't something that just happened in the past. It's an ever going process because this land is still occupied indigenous 
territories, right? And so this continual process that is built upon structures. Um, and so this is an important context for our conversation. Um, I referenced some text here. We're not gonna say each one, um, but I guess later folks really want to know the names of some readings, we have them. And in addition, right, to talking about settler colonialism, obviously when we're talking about black life, um, we're talking about in the United States, how the transatlantic slave trade um, and slavery, particularly that of African peoples and their descendants has operated hand in hand with settler colonial genocide, right? So taken together, the two processes remain embed centuries embedded uh, structures within US society, the economy, all of these things, right? It is here uh, in, in the Western societies, in the Western hemisphere. And, you know, one thing like turning towards thinking about black life and indigenous life is during the earlier years of conquest and betrayal and structural and interpersonal violence against black indigenous people um, in this land that has now become the United States. It's important to note that the nature of violence and dispossession were not merely chance, right? It wasn't just like, oh, we found these people and like, this is just happening. What's happening was racialized narratives, which um, Yasmin has already defined racialized as like the groups that have been assigned racial meeting. Um, there were discourse narratives about these communities that were shared by European invaders over time. In fact, critical scholars have argued that dehumanization of so-called others was crucial to the reasoning behind these social practices, right? Like being able to not see someone as human gives a reason for folks to treat them in particular ways and build systems, economies off of treating them in these ways. And so talking about othering, when we're highlighting, um, you know, talking about, you know, both Native American and Black populations, the ideas shared about their fundamental, fundamental personhood um, matter, right? Debates about their backwardness, whether their culture um, was like depravity or riddled with uh, errors or, you know, Europeans not understanding why they did the things that they, the way that they did. Um, these things were central in the mistreatment um, imagined for them, right? It becomes another reason why it's okay to enslave peoples to take their land, right? Because if they're not human or they're childish or other ideas that were ascribed to these populations, um, then European folks um, had the opportunity to say like, hey, I deserve because I'm this type of person to take over and lead from here. Um, and so I wanna note that while black and indigenous um, as both separate and interconnected populations, right? Because they can overlap and also they have different histories. Um, while they dif uh, suffered different material repercussions an attention to the ways that gender and gender identity was misunderstood, policed and criminalized are central to understanding how anti-blackness has functioned in the US um, society moving forward. Um, because although again, it was different for both populations, the narratives about um, you know third gender or two spirit or different embodiments of gender within these populations also caused suspicions from Europeans that they didn't know how to govern or, or be sovereign over their nations, right? And also, in the next slide, I'll talk about it, when taken into other factors, and more distrust and dehumanization take place. And so, um, bear with me as I talk like um, from, another theoretical standpoint. I do wanna highlight uh, scholars like Dr. Horton Spillers and Sadia Hartman who have argued and shown us through their work that institutions and practices of enslavement influence not only the idea of humanity, right? Like not only the people who deserve 
or are human, but also how gender is imagined for Black people um, due to, you know, sexual, physical, mental violence against enslaved people, the erasure of cultural and historic knowledges over time, and impose religious and social practices. So again, here I'm tying, you know, the dehumanization of people to ideas of gender, because if someone's not a human, they also don't have a gender. Um, you can also take away their family because without a gender, <laughs> they're not connected to family. And there are so many other broad pieces on how gender ideology are, are hooked into these institutions. Um, and a lot of scholars have talked about you know, the lasting effects on on gender, on who we see, in, see as superhuman or monstrous. And I'll take uh, a little bit more examples later. So in addition to that, and establishing what sociologist Manning Marable described as a racist capital social order, right? And so here we're talking about, you know, the fact that certain people have economic access uh, there are legal statutes against Black movement, literally, right? There are lantern laws. There are doctrines that say Black people can't move um, without a light or without um, the, the permission of their enslavers. Um, the Black ownership, so not having access to either property or yourself or your family. And again, laws about gender presentation arrive over time. And so what we're, we're doing here is we're setting the stage, particularly focusing on gender, but we're moving on with the understanding that, you know, historically, it's evident that people of color, um, indigenous people, and black people have over time have lacked of access to social institutions, economy, and other social structures. So as we're moving forward, all of that is, is something that we are holding um, as we move forward and highlighting this part about gender, which is so interesting in addition to all of these other things. And so laws around gender and gender identity, which re-marginalized non-white men and folks who did not own property were cre created around the nation, right? Um, and so already within a place that called people human according to their property value, their ownership, their race, right? Gender became another metric of criminalization and policing. These laws, an example is in Columbus, Ohio, um, an 1848 law criminalized wearing a dress not belonging to his or her sex, right? So you couldn't walk around in public in something that wasn't assigned to your sex, male or female, um, if you were designated a certain sex at birth. And so this law appeared in over 50 U.S. cities, cities over the subsequent decades. Anti-cross-dressing laws became um, a new technology for policing, and some have lasted as long as 2011. Here in the background, which was also the background of this slide, but you can't quite see it, is you know a uh, an illustration of Mary Jones from 1938 by H.R. Robinson, um, and the story of Mary Jones, which also has been talked about by other trans activists and recently included in like a, a speculative fiction film um, by a black trans woman, um, is it tells the story of Mary Jones, who was a transgender woman and possible sex worker, who was charged with pickpocketing wealthy white men she encountered. In New, York, uh, in New York City streets, right? Um, her trial, once she got convicted, was sensationalized due to her gender identity and the statements that she had always socialized uh, in New Orleans dressed as a woman, as herself, right? And so this portrait came out naming Mary Jones as the man monster. And already it's, re-emphasizing ideas about dehumanization and who is inhuman, who is not human. What happens is she's, she is convicted of the crime and she serves five years um, at Sing Sing, which was a hard labor prison. And after she was released, she was actually rearrested for cross-dressing shortly after. Um, 
and uh, information about her kind of disappears from uh, history. But again, um, Mary's story is not only sensationalized, but it represents a type of anti-Black and anti-trans policing. One, for self-determination of wearing what she wants, um, the criminalization of sex work, um, and narratives in general that are repeated over time. Additionally, as we will discuss after the break, right, because this was the quick overview to set the stage of kind of the historical setting we're living in, um, we will talk about how progressive movements have often failed to address the very systems that have allowed for this type of surveillance and policing to take place. Um, because again, this is a part of a pattern of policing black bodies in their movement and their dress and self-determination. Um, these histories have had lasting effects on not only the lives of black trans and gender non-conforming people, but the social, historical, and political framings of US policy interaction and livelihood. Right? Again, I'm emphasizing self-determination because depending on how someone's dressing, how they're moving in the world, right, laws time and time again are affecting this, which is something that does affect more than just black trans and gender non-conforming people, but affects them in particular. Um, and so this is the next section, which is um, exclusion and social justice movements. But right now we are going to take a five minute break um, where I am going to stop sharing um, my screen. And folks, if you need to go get a break, a glass of water, take a break, um, we can do that and we will get back. I'm gonna power down my camera for a quick little break. Awesome, and I guess I'm gonna do the same. So the Facebook Live folks um, catch you in five. Uh, see you at about eight thirty-seven. Well, thank you, everybody. I know we're taking a quick break, but we have um, joining us, we have um, Prabhdeep Singh Kale. So if you want to, um, Prabh, if you wanted to say a couple words, I think during the break, I just wanted to introduce you and I'm glad you could join us. I think you're, oh, oh. there you go. Yes, hello everyone. Vaigurji ka khasa, Vaigurji ki pate. Apologies, um, I'm hopping in a little, uh, a little late for life happened along the way. Um, I'm very excited to be here and thank you everyone for joining tonight as well. Um, tonight's conversation is very personal to me as well. So I'm very thankful for it happening. Um, the reason that I'm really excited that we are able to come together tonight to have this conversation with both Yasmin and Chris um, is because, um, as you will learn, there are so many aspects about uh, fighting for justice that get overlooked. And it's such an important reason, especially as we as six are learning more about our history in the US and in the diaspora, especially as folks that go along you know, different generations, whether it's first generation or second generation, as part of the immigrant diaspora, as we're learning more of our history, um, as Chris and Yasmin will have no doubt already started talking to you about, we overlook so many aspects of our own history. And it's so important to be thinking about both, uh, especially trans lives, but queer, which is lives in the LGBTQI plus community within our own communities. Um, I remember uh, as six, especially, the reason, um, the reason I talk about this a lot, about why it's important to our communities through Sikhi and both Gurbani, is because we come together and we honor each other first as humans, and then we sort of figure out everything afterwards. And I think along the way, a lot of times, 
in society, we're taught to forget to begin there. And we actually start way past it, right? We don't start from Mekongkar, we start way past it. So it's conversations like tonight um, and the questions that we'll doubt have tonight um, will sort of help us figure out how to get back to that Mekongkar, the oneness, so that all the other conversations can happen um, that need to happen for a modern society. And so I don't wanna take up too much time. I just wanted to say that and we'll be, I'm around throughout and at the end, well, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, and I, I would just echo that. I mean, I'm so glad we're having these conversations and uh, really appreciate Rob, uh, Chris, and Yasmin here today. Um, I know we're taking a little break, so um, I think we'll probably be starting up soon. Um, but I, I just want to say, um, like Rob has, has just sort of relayed, um, you know, as we look at, as we study this, U.S. history and we study um, race and we study gender in America at the first session talked about sort of how how this dehumanization of certain groups of people um, is built in sort of the DNA of um, of this country and as six believing in oneness believing in ikongar I think it's really important that we start there and we need to also kind of understand what these things are that are that are built in so we can see if we have you know our own biases or you know our own reason for not um, you know really accepting accepting others fully and recognizing that ikongar. Uh, again, so really appreciative of um, of Rob of you um, you know helping with this series and of uh, Chris and Yasmin, your time today. So I think we'll be starting in a couple minutes. Um, so look forward to um, having you guys back. And hello, Yasmin. And hello. Hello. Is Chris going to be? Yes, oh. we got. Yeah, we'll be All starting. Right. Great, wonderful. Okay, um, now we're going to talk about everyone. Welcome back, first of all. Um, now we're going to talk about exclusion in social justice movements. In this section, we respond more fully to the question, how is transphobia, transphobia excuse me, linked to both intra and inter-community violences in contemporary times and historically? Inequality within progressive social justice movements in the US examples of how structures of oppressions were reproduced with these movements, within these movements, excuse me, anti-Blackness, anti-trans ideologies and practices, everyday exclusions of Black trans and GNC people within society, the more things change, the more things, the say, the things stay the same, anti-trans hate crimes and violence in the present tense. Um, we're going to talk about a timeline of events that happened um, as recently as from as recently as 2014. Um, we're going to go all the way back to starting um, in 1848 um, with the women's rights movement and how um, trans and gender nonconforming people were actually um, forced out of these movements or left outside of them totally. Next, next slide now. While common sense would agree that these movements have open, overlapping interests and communities, the exclusion of Black trans experiences persists within many committees and, I'm sorry, communities and movements. And in some ways, um, we're still fighting against that today. Like, yeah, you can go to the next time. Trans exclusionary feminism. The women's movement, which has gone through different phases that span the suffrage movement, economic rights activism, and other focuses on social equality for women has been critiqued for many failures, including racism, classism, and transphobia. Called out by women of color and trans people, the 1970s marked a period of tension within the women's movement. Sometimes labeling themselves as gender critical, trans exclusionary actions persisted through the 1970s and onward even into our current time. 
which included the protesting and ridiculing of trans women attending women's conferences and festivals. A proliferation of anti-trans sentiment still continues, including the rejection of self-determination of trans women, trans men, and gender non-conforming folks in media, scholarship, and political spaces supposedly feminist in nature. A recent issue within the academic journal, the Sociological Review focuses on, on anti-trans and biological determinism within feminism in the UK and globally. globally. Read Turf Wars, Feminism and the Fight for Transgender Futures, edited by Ben Vincent, Sonia Ekrinin and Ruth Parse to learn more. So those are our resources um, where we're getting, um, you can find out more about the women's movement and the exclusion of trans people. Like the women's movement, the labor movement has been critiqued over time due to its lack of attention to racial, ethnic, and gender equality, inequality. Despite the fact that more statements and awareness about discrimination against LGBTQ workers proliferated in the 1970s, labor movements lack true attention to the needs of transgenders and queer workers. This exclusion is important to note because transgender and gender nonconforming people often face disproportionate rates of unemployment and discrimination. According to the National Center for Transgender Equality, one in four transgender people have lost a job due to bias in addition to harassment, violations of privacy, and other forms of labor violence that occur. Just some of the quick stats. In 2011, there was a report done, I'm sorry, a national survey done um, about transgender um, discrimination, and 90% of respondents reported workplace mistreatment or discrimination. Folks who had lost a job were four times more, uh, more likely to experience homelessness than those who didn't lose a job in that survey. Paradoxically, the gay rights movement has also historically devalued and erased transgender experiences and activism. Records show that some of the first known gay and lesbian groups in the US rejected and devalued non-normative gender identities and expressions. While the gay rights movement made significant gains over the years, racial and class-based inequality still persisted, especially in the inclusion of transgender communities. In 1971, the Gay Activist Alliance excluded protections for gender identity and expression because it was too extreme. Transgender Puerto Rican activist Sylvia Rivera was famously booed off stage at a 1973 Pride rally. She, alongside transgender icon Marsha P. Johnson, were later banned from participating in New York City Pride. Almost 40 years later, anti-trans practices still persisted. In 2007, the Human Rights Campaign, one of the largest LGBTQ organizations, failed to include gender identity and expression with advocacy around the Employment and Non-Discrimination Act. Free at last, Black freedom movements and equality. Unfortunately, Black trans folks have also faced anti-violence and discrimination from their own racial communities. Throughout the civil rights and Black power movement, it was widely known that women and LGBTQ folk were decentered within activism, social life, and policy initiatives. Respectability politics ideas about who or what should be seen in the public sector, often erase the labor of poor, queer, and trans Black activists. Despite the party's ideology, which at time reflected quite advanced thinking about gender and sexual liberation, 
deeply rooted sexism made the struggle for gender and sexual equality difficult. As with men in the broader world, changing Panthers men chauvinistic attitudes and practices was a major challenge. Nationalism has historically been a gendered project centered on patriarchy and male privilege. The revolutionary black nationalism of the Black Panther Party began as part of that traditional project. Quoted, this is quoted from the Black Against Empire, the history and politics of the Black Panther Party party, which is a book, and you can find more about this on its page 307. The violences faced by transgender and gender nonconforming people are deeply connect connected to these movements and social institutions. Black transgender and gender nonconforming people often face struggles in their religions, communities, face higher rates of intimate partner violence and the effect of class, colorism, and anti-Blackness. Anti-trans violence, personal and institutional collections. This is just a photo of Nina Pop and Tona McCade, I'm sorry, McDade, and all of, um, and just mentioning of all of other trans, Black trans individuals murdered by police violence and um, they're still being justice seek, um, sought in both of those cases. Um, as of August 2020, 28 transgender people were found murdered by partners, law enforcement, or other contacts. Because of misgendering and misreporting, this number is thought to be higher. According to the 2018 report of the US Transgender Survey made up by nearly 28,000 responses, almost half, 47% of all black respondents reported being denied equal treatment, verbally harassed and or physically attacked in the previous year because of being transgender. Also according, I'm sorry, according to a 2016 report of the US Transgender Survey, 57% of transgender people are afraid to consult police when they need to. In the 2019 Failing to Protect and Serve report, over 58% of transgender people who've interacted with police experience harassment, ab abuse, or other mistreatment. Imagining liberation, Black trans power revisited. In a world of equality, um, Black transgender and gender nonconforming people have always resisted oppression and dreamed up of new and old visions of liberation. In this section, we're going to discuss about contemporary, contemporary transgender activism in the United States. We're going to be highlighting from grassroots organizations and political with um, about political engagements. Centering Black trans power here and everywhere. By calling on examples from research, we will also look at how the developments in the US are connected to other movements around the globe. Thank you so much for laying that foundation, um, uh, Yasmin. And, and also, right, to highlight is this um, background that we're giving, we're seeing it as really integral to understanding the activism that I'm going to be talking about right now, right? Because trans, um, Black trans specifically, and gender nonconforming folks are living in uh, a U.S. society that, um, through these different examples, we're talking about like great hostility and historical, legal, structural inequality happening, right? Um, but you know, we persist, right? Black trans folks are imagining ways to live in in these environments and also trying to think about ways that maybe we all can live better, right? Um, and so um, here is like a, a crop photo of Sylvia Rivera and Masha P. Johnson, who um, uh, Yasmin already mentioned earlier. Um, and this is them at, at a gay rights rally, um, literally behind a police barricade, right? And, and that really frames this point where 
aside from and despite structural and institutional and interpersonal violences, trans activists have operated throughout time in US history, right? And so even um, though in this PowerPoint, we don't spend a lot of time talking about like the cultural productions or the social life of black trans people. However, if um, you know, if you've seen any pop culture references like the, the FX series Pose, right? Black trans people have existed they're gonna continue existing from the beginning, you know, of, of how gender was being uh, uh, policed in during times of slavery onward, right? Um, so that resistance is there um, and it's in this hostile climate. And so I just wanna put that as a, as a uh, jump off point because through this history, we just know um, we exist in, in it's not a new phenomenon, right? Um, and that being said, right, in addition to leading historical events like the 1959 Cooper Donuts riot in downtown LA, the 1966 Compton's Cafeteria riot in San Francisco, and the 1969 Stonewall riots in NYC, transgender and gender nonconforming folks have influenced broader social movements and cultural con um, consciousness. In all of these places, right, um, the Stonewall rights have an interesting like historical battle over the narrative of who was there and who was not there. Um, but in all of these places and beyond, right, trans and gender nonconforming people have been in the struggle for folks at the bottom of the rungs of society. So um, one thing I do want to highlight before I get to the sidebar is, for instance, if anybody gets a chance to watch uh, the documentary called Major, which covers the life of activist and um, community member Miss Major, um, you know, she, when she was incarcerated, talked to folks about gender and liberation inside of prison before um, the Attica prison rebellion, right? So black trans people are out here making moves. And talking about the root, right? I had mentioned this earlier, structures that are at the root of inequality, but also trans activism, particularly black transgender and gender nonconforming activists, have worked to create organizations and collectives that often address the root causes of poverty, like homelessness, um, anti-Black criminalization and policing, anti-sex workers ideology, food insecurity, civil rights and legal rights, um, and access to self-determination, however that may take shape. Um, for example, uh, STAR, which was like called street transvestite action revolutions, revolutionaries were founded by uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera to both provide shelter and political education for queer and trans people in New York City, right? And so this theme of like acting on people's needs is something that we see in black trans activism. And, and here in this next photo, right, in some ways, we're jumping ahead in timelines. Um, this photo is actually from uh, Brooklyn in June 2020, a rally for Black Trans Lives that had over 10,000 attendees happened, um, starting at the Brooklyn Museum and then subsequently to a march. Um, the numbers um, are have been labeled as between you know 10,000 to 15,000 people, um, and that in many ways was known to be a kind of social moment as one of the most, the largest black trans organized and um, thematic events to happen and gather. And this was right after, you know, uh, the deaths of Tony McDade, of Nina Pop, and so many other folks. Additionally, you know, um, activists and organizers were talking about um, the deaths of people like Leyland Polanco, who died at Rikers um, in a truly tragic and horrific way uh, among other people. And so really recalling the names and histories of black trans life that has been lost. And also, um, you know, there was this reverberation. Um, actually, uh, I was somewhere near that yellow. Um, there's no way to zoom in on that. Um, but over and over, even in the crowd, what I was hearing and what was being said by the speakers was people are sick and tired of talking about trans life when people are dead, right? And so 
really talking about giving us our flowers while we're still here. Um, because people are here, they are organizing, and they're, they want to push back against the historical and structural violence that they know to be facing their own, our own communities. Um, and so what I'm going to do kind of quickly um, in these next slides is I'm going to talk and reference different organizations that if you're interested, I would suggest either looking up, following their work, um, and also highlighting the different ways groups have been addressing issues facing transgender and gender non-conforming folks in our nation, right? Um, so organizations like SNAPCO, Solutions Not Punishment Collective, Breakout, um, TGI Justice Project, the Audre Lorde Project, and the Black LGBT T Migrant Project, BLMP, work on political education and movement building through critical abolitions, abolitionist lenses that center self-determination and liberation, right? So the, what I wanna invoke again is, so earlier when we're talking about the inequalities that trans folks are facing, um, including policing, right? Lack of access to self-determination, um, and, and uplifting, and I'm gonna uplift it again later, is like, for instance, the LGBT mi migrant project that's centering abolition um, and by abolitionist lens, you know, talking about ending policing as a predatory practice uh, that's super prevalent, overly prevalent in society, right? Um, the LGBT migrant project is looking at uh, detention and incarceration and how that affects black, queer and trans people um, you know, located across the globe and in the US. Um, but these other collectives like SNAPCO have been um, running very progressive and critical services and training for TG and C people to kind of learn about their own history and challenge the structures that are working to police them. Um, and, and those are located all over the countries, including New Orleans, uh, Georgia, New York, and other places, right? GLITS, Gay and Lesbians Living in a Transgender Society, The Ochre Project, For the Girls, Black Trans Travel Fund, Trans Justice Project, all work to move either funds directly towards trans and gender non-conforming folks, or help to cover the cost of services like housing, safe access to food, mental health services, gender affirmation surgeries, and transportation. Um, like, for instance, thinking about um, STAR um, and other organizations, what I'll mention next, um, like House of Gigi, um, these organizations are addressing fundamental concerns, like, as Yasmin mentioned, you know, if lack of ac economic access housing inequality, which is disproportionately facing Black trans people and, and Black queer people um, within the LGBT community, right? So these interventions are working to make sure trans and gender non-conforming people can literally exist in society. And so they're taking a very hands-on and self-determination based approach because by giving people funds for things like gender affirmation surgery, um, which um, can be very costly and just a barrier for living um, someone's, not only their best life, but living a safe um, way that they really desire. They're giving access directly to trans people to live in society the way, as they need to and want to. Um, and other organizations, right? There's so many more, um, like the Black TGNC Collective, Brave Space Alliance, um, Black Visions Collective, Trans Women of Color Collective, and the San Carlos of House um, are cultural and supportive spaces that also do political education work um, and uh, you know, generally support TGNC folks in various cities across the United States, um, building community in otherwise sometimes hostile um, social spaces. And finally, um, highlighting the Trans People of Color Coalition, Transgender Law Center, and Transgender Law and Policy Institute, um, Transcending Barriers, Atlanta, the Marsha P, Marsha P. Johnson Institute, the National Black Justice Coalition, the New York Transgender Advocacy Organization, 
all of these organizations that I'm mentioning are part of a contingent of Black-led organizations focusing on policy and advocacy, particularly in a time that, again and again, folks have to um, kind of argue for and push for their rights. Um, as, men uh, as Yasmin was mentioning earlier, right, the transgender legal protections when it comes to economic access and labor um, are and have been up for grabs over time. Um, and access and advocacy by and for trans people of color, by and for black trans people work to ensure that people are being able to um, truly advocate and have basic citizenship rights that are often erased from society. And shifting kind of globally just for a second, and I'm just gonna really quickly talk about this and, and hopefully we can get some good conversation time, um, is I do wanna highlight how black and transgender nonconforming activism has reverberated around the globe because black people and black trans people exist everywhere. Um, and so on one hand, right, um, as we mentioned earlier, like I'm a sociologist, I. Um, and, and specifically focusing on Black, queer, and trans people in my research. Um, and one thing that I've noticed within my research and within general um, uh, publications is that, you know, in the past two years, the transnational campaigns of what folks call the Movement for Black Lives um, have highlighted more and more the concerns of Black, queer, and trans, and gender variant people within their policy platforms. Um, and so within that timeline that Yasmin took us on and highlighted different pieces of, you know, movements that have taken place. And of course there are so many more, but the whole world is, you know, would be on the timeline and, and we wouldn't have had time to share. Um, but even the pieces that Yasmin already articulated and highlighted, um, Right. Some of the critiques that were earlier happening when the movement for Black Lives, as we know it, in 2014 were taking place, had the same critiques. Right. Um, early on, you know, folks were talking about, um, especially right, if we talk about after um, the Trayvon Martin case, after Mike Brown, after Eric Garner, these were names that folks in the world and in the US said over and over. And, and it left black, queer and trans people saying, hey, you know, we are also facing violence too. We're showing up for you. Are you gonna say our names as well? Um, and so for the Movement for Black Lives, which is a major coalition to really take on gender um, and sexuality in the way that it does, particularly because hashtag Black Lives Matter was created by three Black women um, is really important. And Black and trans activism is a major uh, reason why this has taken place. Um, and that is, has global assemblages. And also there have been major summits of activism connections um, from activists living all over in different parts of the world. Um, you know, a few, for instance, uh, the example I'm going to give is a uh, few have taken place in Brazil over the past few years where activists have been talking to each other and sharing the inequalities that they face together. Um, and, and one example, right, thinking through Brazil, um, so Black, um, trans, and gender nonconforming activists have made um, major gains in political spaces. Again, this is happening over time, it's already, but I, I wanna highlight um, Erika Malanguinho um, becoming the first trans person elected to Sao Paulo's legislator, um, particularly in the government context that it is right now in Brazil. Um, and so not only was she the first um, black trans person in that legislative uh, capacity, um, she like actually, and here I'm thinking of, uh, Andrea Jenkins, who is a US-based activist um, and uh, involved in politics, Erica has pushed for a transformative agenda that centers the rights of folks experiencing homelessness in the city, poor communities, um, folks living in the peripheral regions of Sao Paulo, while also lifting up indigenous and black cultural knowledges. That last part, highlighting indigenous and black cultural knowledges is especially important um, 
in a time where, you know, religious discrimination exists in Brazil, um, in a time where often ideas about race and racism are discarded, um, and, you know, and, and in fact, these communities are being targeted, even if folks don't want to talk about race being a reason why. And so her platforms that she pushes, which also involve many other Black trans activists and Black trans women activists in Brazil, um, really uplifts communities in a very special way. Um, she also founded her own cultural and political education center in uh, Sao Paulo um, before COVID times and all that good stuff. I was actually traveling in Brazil. Um, on a Fulbright and visiting that space over and over again as a space of Black political thought um, was not merely magical, although it was, um, but it was really important to see somewhere, again, you know, shaped by a Black trans woman that is highlighting Black political thought, activism, and freedom, right? And so that was the space and, and, and truly like a community space um, where there's food and music and then also um, a place to gather. Unfortunately, you know, COVID has happened. And so I am not in Sao Paulo right now. Um, but I, I did want to highlight that specific case. Um, and um, before we wrap up, um, just highlighting again across Brazil, Black trans activists and cultural productions, um, like in the US, are, are booming. Um, and more so, ideas about land, indigeneity, um, and critiques of, you know, predatory capitalism or something coming out of Black trans, Black spaces in the global South, in Brazil, uh, and in other communities in ways that are, are really beautiful and, and important for us to dream about what liberation um, kind of looks like. Um, and so uh, this is where we start to wrap up. Um, throughout this presentation, I kind of sped through this last part, um, but I hope that some questions or comments will come up. Um, but in general, we discussed like historical, political, and legal challenges faced by Black, trans, and gender non-conforming people. Um, overall, we touched on, you know, political and social institutional contexts in the U.S., progressive movements, and Black gender, transgender life. Um, uh, and finally, you know, Black trans activism and resilience and a little bit from abroad, right, in, in those two examples. Um, and so that's what we have offered. Um, and let me pass that to Yasmin. Okay. Um, by doing so, we work to provide context for Black trans experience here and highlighting the agency of Black trans and gender nonconforming folks in society. We hope that these examples, particularly the ways in which Black TGNC activists fight for themselves, offer ideas about social justice and leadership for all folks interested in liberation. I am, um, thank you everyone for um, bearing with us through this presentation and thank you for having us and listening and being interested in knowing this information about this subject matter. Um, I just want to mention um, about a few recent court cases that um, helped to change um, laws in various states and cities throughout the United States. Um, as far as, as, as recent as this year, a case being um, being won by a trans man um, attending school um, by the name of Graham, um, Gavin Graham, his last name is Graham, Gavin Graham, identified as a transgender male. After coming out as transgender, he began using the men's restroom and nearly two months, after nearly two months, his parents, of the parents of other children of the school complained to the county school board. And then there was a policy created prohibiting um, Graham from going to the bathroom of his um, identified gender. And so he went to um, court through it. Um, 
people like Donald Trump got involved in it. And um, this year he finally won that case. Um, and there are some other um, cases. And I just wanted to highlight that is to show that we're still fighting, we're still pushing back. Um, we're still uh, attempting to break down walls of oppressions and systems of, of oppressions. And um, even as recent as 2011, we were actually illegal to still illegal in New York City to walk around as our, as our identified gender and in, clothe, in clothing and um, in fellowship with things that match that. Um, so yes, um, there are a few other court cases that are attached on, on a slide here at the end that um, people can do some research and just go take a look to get more in-depth information about um, for whatever reason. Um, yes, that's all I have. Awesome, thank you so much, Yasmin. Also to uplift like recent court wins, which are important in this context of oppression and inequality. And then also that more work is always needed to be done. And so that's what I'm hearing um, from you and uplifting those things. And, and again, we do have like different preferences, um, but I think right now, before talking about those, um, we are going to take another five minute break. Um, I'm gonna sip on more water, although you've already seen me do that. Um, and if you have some questions, I just saw some pop up in the chat. Um, feel free to send them to myself, um, Yasmin, or any of the other hosts of the webinar um, because they are cur curating them. And again, just thank you for listening. I hope this was a thought provoking conversation and we're looking forward to doing some q and I'm going to stop screen sharing right now. Um, and I guess we will come back around 9.15. And then I will just say something just shortly um, as people are thinking about what kind of questions they want to ask um, and also wanting to uplift and echo what both of you just said. If you have questions, uh, feel free, you can send them individually to one of us, uh, to myself, and we can uh, share them out. Or as some of you have been doing, you can also share them to the panelists. Um, one thing that as you're thinking about questions and as you're trying to think about how to ask things or what to ask, because sometimes when you learn new information, um, you're trying to just hold on to the words that now you're like starting to see things and understand things in new ways. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that like a lot of the language and the terms and the social rules um, and social norms that we may be learning about today in classrooms or workspaces or in the news or social medias may seem new, right? But as both um, Chris and Yasmin have very clearly shown us, that doesn't mean that the people behind these words or the needs that they've been fighting for are new themselves, right? Um, because even in our own communities, um, especially in the South Asian context, we can never say that uh, gender non-conforming people did not exist because um, there are communities have some of the oldest gender non-conforming um, documented communities. Um, and we think about them quite negatively within our own communities, right? We, uh, they're much more um, fighting for their rights in India and across the South Asian context. We see them fighting more for their rights um, in the news. It doesn't mean they weren't fighting for them before, um, but now we're actually getting the news for it. And just wanted to uplift that and that the topics we discuss may be confusing at first and they may be frustrating and overwhelming, but for a lot of other people, there are, it's also freeing and affirming and long overdue that these conversations are happening within our sick spaces, especially um, in relationship and collaboration with ongoing and historic black trans liberation fights um, and movements. So it's important to see that we have to be able to hold on to the th that in order to build the sort of sangat that we actually want to build. Um, so as you're thinking about questions, uh, also feel free to think about like, ask about how do we actually build these relationships and collaborations that you're thinking about um, or that you're maybe now starting to think about. Those are types of questions you can ask as well um, about how to take the information that has been so beautifully shared with us tonight and how to take it into our own daily lives. I will have questions for that as well, um, but you're just have sort of think broadly about how you wanna engage with the information um, that has been shared here tonight. So I'll leave, give you a minute of actual silence to think through this. <laughs> 
Okay, I will go ahead um, and start off with the questions. Thank you. I hope uh, everyone took this the quiet time to think of some things. So the first one that I sort of wanted to start off with um, is I will, this is the one that was sent in most recently. Um, it touches on sort of the last topic, Chris, that you were touching about, um, that you said yourself, you know, that you got a chance to, you didn't get, you sort of had to rush through it. So maybe this is a chance to sort of uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, so to both of you, how have activist groups um, helping trans people in other countries with other legal contexts where um, maybe folks aren't allowed to openly declare who they are both in either terms of their minoritized gender or sexual identity, um, how have activists in your experiences been engaging with supporting those communities? Um, because we do have a lot of folks within our community who do global work. Um, so as ha knowing how that has sort of been ongoing might help folks also think about how to broaden the scope of their own work. Yes, um, if I, I'm gonna uh, give a, a really quick answer and it's the first, I read it and then it was the first thing that jumped to mind. Um, and so on one hand, right, like again, these connections have been happening over time, throughout time. I was just kind of ha um, listing like the past five to 10 years um, because of my re research focus and to give kind of really quick nuggets of things that are going on. Um, I do want to uplift the work of, again, the Black LGBTQ Migrant Project um, because they actually, so they're doing work in terms of working with migrants, um, are often working with communities who are experiencing multiple forms of uh, inequality from wherever they're migrating from. And then in the case of, since uh, BLMP is based in the United States, you know, and then also they're coming here as like black trans and gender non-conforming people and then facing intense imprisonment, policing um, and detention by US um, migration systems. Um, and so in a lot of ways, just directly that that particular organization works around the nuances of kind of like the transnational narrative of trans life. Um, and, and I hope I make sense when I when I say that. Um, but that that is just a concrete example of these are folks that are intimately connected to um, like the international context and knowledge about how the fact that, you know, trans life is not, um, and in some places, is policed in different ways. Um, and I think, you know, there are other examples um, off the top of my head. I, I'll try to like think of another one if it comes up. Um, but I also wanna highlight that trans folks from particular places where they're being prosecuted by countries and governments are working of out creative ways to make these transnational connections for themselves and like determining it for themselves. And I think a lot of the onus that other folks have, right, and we're talking about allyship, um, is listening to what people need. Actually recently, someone kind of consulted with me about a question um, where it was someone one of their friends is an activist, a gay activist, not trans, um, from a specific region that criminalizes um, queer and trans identity, um, and specifically thinking of trans identity. And this person is, is not trans, but really wanted to help out. And so their friend like was like consulting me on how they should approach that situation. And my response was very specific because, um, you know, people need to move uh, in uh, and with the knowledge and affirmation of people on the ground. Um, and so I think the best way activists are often uplifting each other is really listening to what their needs are in a particular place, right? Um, there's a book, um, hold on one second, I'm looking off screen uh, so I can get the, the name right. Um, uh, the, the, and I'm just going to quickly, the queer, um, the ec economies of queer inclusion, um, transnational organizing for LGBT rights in Uganda, um, by SM Rodriguez. It's a recent book that just came out in, in 2018, hardcover. There's a Kindle edition, um, get it from your library. Um, but SM also talks about 
like the the transnational nature of identity but also how capitalism and how identity is far more complicated and one size does not fit all um and so uh, this is a really long-winded version uh, of the answer that i wanted to give but I, I hope this is a kind of context of an answer and this uh, also for thank you for that and for both of you as well um I think this connects nicely to sort of what you were saying just now, Chris, but also sort of the, some other questions we've had in terms of how do we check our own biases in doing this work or how can we best support um, transgender communities across the globe and also at home. One thing for, in both of, something that was so uh, regular throughout the conversation in your presentation was you modeled this openness to learning new knowledge um, of also openness to, uh, other people sort of communicating what you said, right? Their needs to you that maybe they weren't aware of themselves or you weren't aware of or they weren't aware of and, and things of that sort. Um, and you're both also involved in activist communities, activists yourselves and things. So as you've come across this probably in your own work, sort of combining a few of these questions about how to address biases and how to also support communities, um, are there things that you've learned in your own organizing from your own conversations that help bridge sort of folks' different approaches or levels of experience with this uh, knowledge, um, both in your organizing, so in like your day-to-day -day conversations of like trying to tell people that this matters, right, for this particular community, but also for others, but also in sort of like the interpersonal relations that you've had of um, navigating, you know, getting people to not those sort of conversations that you've had? Have there been helpful moments that help bridge those knowledge gaps? Um, for me, um, like, yes, I'm always learning and, and, and unlearning biases myself. Um, so I do have a certain level of understanding and apathy. Um, but the first thing that I would want to say that um, would be as first step is being willing willing to be open minded and building honest um, and respectful relationship with any group of people that you may not understand or that you may have just like understanding that biases are things that we are taught um, and sometimes in our own in, in many of our cases at no fault of our own is what our parents was taught is what our religion. Um, taught us it's just different things and so these things embedded in us over a period of time and so when we see things that challenge what we believe should exist or that should it be um our biases can develop so the thing about it is it's just started starting to dwell and participate in just activities with the with the whatever group especially trans and gender non-conforming people um attending a a local um event um for organizing held by an organization like the audrey lord project the sylvia rivera law um law projects um there are constantly different things facebook groups um in different social media sites where you can just go and intermingle and learn and listen to the stories and life experiences of trans and gender non-conforming people. And um, the biggest thing that had the biggest thing that I have learned from organizing um, for my own personal self about is just being more being more willing to just listen. Um, sometimes I even call myself out on the fact of thinking I know so much about a particular subject or a group of people. And once I really get involved in that subject or around those group of people, I realize how little I know. And so learning and just being willing to understand. Um, yeah, and that's all I want to say. Yes, um, yes. So you just laid it down, Yasmin. So I love that. And I think, um, like in taking that someone else posted a question on like how to best support the trans community um, is also like highlighting as Yasmin said is listening um, and also being real about where you are. And so those two pieces that you highlighted were so important to me because I think what is beautiful just about the resilience and activism of trans and gender non-conforming people is often it's coming from a place where you know they're being real with themselves in the changes um, and of the identity and experience over time, um, and the 
that approach, right? The willingness to see the change and expansion and, and just coming to a place um, where you're not only seeking knowledge, um, but trying to make room for everyone to live like the best, most self-determination, the best, most liberated life um, and acknowledging sometimes that's gonna be different than what you know I or you might think for ourselves and it could be still valid, right? Um, and I think what happens a lot is folks talk or like see trans people as um, you know, whether it's to agree or not to agree. And actually it's just kind of like trans people exist. So there's nothing to agree about. Um, they are there. Um, and then it's like arriving to a place where it's like, do you support another person living and thriving in society? Do you support that? And then asking them how to best support them in that case. Um, a different concrete thing, if you're looking right now, um, like obviously economic support is always important in this organization, like in this presentation, I was intentional in listening, listing the names of a few different organizations. Um, all of them, like economic support is helpful. Or if you don't have that, um, you know, passing on information that you've heard. And, you know, in cases where I think of, um, in terms of, and this is also the activist piece, and I'll get off my soapbox um, after this, but I think some of the best activism that I've seen from trans and gender nonconforming people and my, my friends, like my good friends and community is standing up for someone when something is going wrong. And, and that is the, sometimes the hardest thing to do. It is sometimes much easier to give $5 than it is to, you know, maybe talk to your cousin and say, hey, actually that person over there is just existing. Why do you want to bother them? And I know in my life, I've wished for the moment where other people have done it. And then also seeing trans and gender, non -con gender non-conforming people model that behavior has all, always been life-giving. Um, and so that's where I am answering that question as well. Thank you. Um, and also being conscious of time. So sort of being this, the, the last question formally in case, and if anyone else has any others, feel free to send them through, but I'll sort of share this question as sort of a, a wrap up sort of a question. Someone had asked um, what they asked of how to, how six can act in or respond to this in particular. Um, and just to sort of make those connections a little bit more specific, sort of what you were both sharing right now, right? About wanting, uh, needing to go out and actually learn from people. I think a lot of times in our communities, we have a tendency to think that we need to go out and find one ourselves and sort of like make them the spokespersons for their communities and be like, oh, I've talked to one person, now I've learned everything, right? But what both of you have sort of very clearly said is like, there are organizations, people are getting together as groups to sort of already support the, uh, the rights that are and the needs that are, we're fighting for. So sort of finding those organizations or those groups already rather than trying to tokenize individuals who are like what you said, just trying to live their lives, right? And just trying to get from point A to point B. So in that sense, as we have very big um, sick communities, both in you know the New York area and California, both the Bay and Los Angeles. So just sort of highlighting to folks who are asking about how can we as six be active? Um, we live in areas where there is a lot of activism around this. So there is honestly no reason why like our organizations are not reaching out to existing organizations, why our peoples and our sangats are not reaching out and saying, you know, where maybe there's a different organization we can provide longer to that weekend um, and try and thinking about actually providing the services and the needs that people are looking for. Um, so sort of like at, now with that big sort of opening, the actual question, um, sort of thinking about building these collaborations. You've mentioned a few organizations, but you've also mentioned how to listen to people who maybe have a different worldview or a different experience. And you've given us some strategies for how to navigate that new information. Um, one specific thing that might be helpful is within a lot of communities, sort of topics around gender-based vi violence are sort of taboo, is the phrase that's also used. Um, sort of like cultural norms, don't, are, we're not supposed to talk about this, right? Especially in South Asian communities where it's sort of, 
been we've been here so long and yet still there's this silence around it um as you've sort of in your collaborations worked across uh those sort of like cultural barriers or sort of like hit up against those sort of things um how have you dealt with these issues of people wanting to say, no, we need good role models. No, you can't be a spokesperson for this community. Um, because that's a very big element within our communities around this sort of respectability of politics around, no, that person isn't the right type of person who should get attention. Um, we can't uplift them because they may like bring bad imagery or news to the community. How have you sort of um, come up against those and like sort of recentered the conversation maybe on like we're talking about human life here um, we're talking about how we as can support human life so sort of bringing it back to sort of what you both have said right this is about human needs and think how to recenter the conversations around that um, and then I will and then I'll come back after you've answered and just sort of wrap up at the end. <laughs> Yeah, I want to first um, say one thing I understand with any group of people, there is no group of people that is monolithic, meaning no group of people all has the same ideas, even within religion, even within religion sections. So you're just going to have different groups of people. Um, and everybody has a right, a God-given right to have their voice heard, whatever it is, whether I like it and disagree with it. And for me, um, I always think I'd rather for you to say it and put it out there so I can know how to operate and navigate um, myself you know, through that. Um, what I do as an activist in those, in those, those instances is just say, is just say, hey, take a look. Um, Mm. Can, can you fill in for a second, Chris? I kind of lost my train of yeah. thought with that. I, actually, you led me to the point. Is for me, is like I how I reframe this question, reframe it is so when thinking about representation, I'm like, well, I ask myself, well, why do I not want to hear from this person? What does hearing this like? Um, and and feel free to take it another way. But how I interpret uh, interpreted this question was you know often when we want to be represented of course we want to put our like quote best face forward but who is that and often asking that question will have us start asking other questions because if the best face is the lightest face is the richest face is the you know what i mean and, and that is when we're like oh these are we have to talk to ourselves first um we have to check in with ourselves and and really ask are we interested in people um, achieving self-determination, equality, living their best lives in a world where they're not being persecuted, right? Or do we want to do something else? And then if whatever your answer is, is not, oh, I want them to live their best life how they need to and live, like actually physically live, then it's like looking at what those other answers give. Um, because and, and also, who, who is that for? What is the face you want to give for? You know what I'm saying? Did you get back what you were thinking, Yasmin? Yeah, and or I just want to say also, like, you know, throughout history, um, colorism and other things have been used to keep a certain nar narrative within the trans community, um, within the world, you know, just all communities worldwide. Um, and yes, and, and, and when just how I navigate myself with that is just facing it and just saying, hey, listen, if you don't like the person, there's other options over there. Um, listen to what this person has to say or not. Just you have no right to prevent this person from expressing themselves as being like a representation of a certain campaign. Of course, there are some things that we do not want people to say and do when talking about, let's say, um, sexual violence or um, um, employ unemployment and just different things of that nature. You want correct information out there. You want those type of things. But you have, like in, in today's world, you have a remote control, you have your legs, you can walk away or however it is you move about and navigate in the world. You can always just go the other way because sometimes it's not always about trying to change their mind. It's or trying to, um, it's not always about trying to change their mind 
or to um, get this perfect representation of the perfect being within any group. Um, I don't believe that there is one. We have what it is that you may like or we may like and other people have what they may like. Um, it's, it's still, we must still put to what it is we're speaking, we must practice it. I'm gonna say it like that. Um, if we want everyone to have um, equal representation, then everyone has to have equal representation uh, and equal opportunities to make their voice heard. And it's, it's really nothing for me to do as an active, but just follow uh, my own personal principles since I'm claiming or, you know, wanting to live by them and wanting others to live by them. So, yeah. Okay, thank you both. Um, and with us now, with time, I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap it up and say thank you both for sharing so much of your time with us and so much of your knowledge time with us. Um, and I think sort of what you've left to us with is this idea of, yes, we do need to understand more of things that we don't understand. But at the end of the day, if we, we're never going to get a 100% understanding and if our support and for communities and fighting for justice is dependent on somehow getting 100% of the information before we can actually start doing something. That's not a realistic goal. So we have to start acting as we're learning um, and continue learning as we're going. And I think that's a lesson that is sort of echoing across this political education series and is definitely something that both of you have shared with us. So thank you to everyone who came out tonight to also listen and thank you for asking these questions. Thank you again to the panelists for coming out and taking the time on a Sunday evening at that. Um, feel free to reach out to Saldaf or any of the organizations that our wonderful panelists have mentioned as well. If you have any other questions, um, and yeah, just thank you so much for taking the time tonight. And we will go ahead and log off unless Chris or Yasmin have anything that they'd like to say before I go ahead and click the. No, no just thank everyone for listening and thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And until our next session um, for session five, enjoy the, have a great start of your weekening, of your week, not weekend, week. Bye, everyone.